What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content here on my channel, then make sure you hit the like button, and make sure you hit subscribe so you can help decide what direction the content on my channel goes in, in the foreseeable future. What's going on guys, this is Rob, and today I wanted to try something a little bit different. If you follow my channel, you know that I've done a lot of videos on Omega level and beyond Omega level mutants from the Marvel Universe. But today I wanted to try and cross over to the DC side of things. The kicker about this is that DC does not have any sort of classification system for naming the most dangerous or powerful threats in their universe. And so what we're gonna do is simply just apply the Omega level concept to DC's characters. Now, for our first installment of this series, I guess for the DC aspect anyway, we're gonna focus on none other than the Joker. But of course, we're not talking about the Joker in his regular form, since as a character without superpowers, the Joker would be nowhere near Omega level. For this video, we're talking about the Joker as he appeared in the Emperor Joker storyline, which ran through all four of DC's Superman titles during the year 2000. Now, the funny thing about this is that under normal circumstances, we do our Omega level characters by focusing on the entire history of their powers, usually because so many of them have been around for so long. With Emperor Joker, we don't have that luxury. And so what we're gonna do is the same thing we did with the Marquis of Death, where we basically just run through the story. Now, what happens here is that we open with Superman escaping from his cell at Arkham Asylum, and we find out that he's wanted for the murder of Lex Luthor, although he has no recollection of even doing this or who Lex Luthor is. We briefly see one of Superman's classic villains, Mr. Mixopidelic, who I'm gonna call Mr. M for the remainder of this video, chasing him down, but failing to gain his attention. Soon after, Superman encounters one of his longtime villains, Bizarro, who attempts to take him back into custody. This fight leads Superman to the office building of Lois Lane, who's the owner of a business called Lane Corp, and Lois refuses to help Superman, and he's soon taken back into custody by Bizarro and back to Arkham Asylum. Now, by this point, it's evident to the reader that everything is out of place in this reality. Bizarro, who's usually just kind of dumb, is a member of a group calling itself the JLA alongside Poison Ivy in a team of villains that we've never seen before. Aquaman is the guy with the head of a fish and cannot go anywhere near water. Jimmy Olsen is calling himself Grave Digger Lad and hangs out in a cemetery digging graves all day. And Lois Lane is a bald businesswoman that's motivated by her own self-interest interests above everything else. We also find out that basically everything's happening in a continuous loop. Superman breaks out of Arkham Asylum every day, he's captured by Bizarro every day, and then returned to custody just to go through the entire process yet again the next day. Now, eventually, Superman is moved to a UFO functioning as a floating prison where he meets Hank Aaron Irons, a fellow inmate. This also noticed that things are not quite right in this universe. The two of them manage to escape and are visited by Mr. M, who tells them the answer of why everything seems out of sorts. Now, with the help of Lois Lane, who has had a change of heart and agreed to help Superman because she feels sorry for him and she's rich enough to own a spaceship, I guess, Superman and Hank Irons, who's reclaimed his old mantle of steel, travel to the moon to find answers they're searching for. Now, as a side note, here, I'm not sure why Steel's alter ego is Hank Aaron Irons instead of his traditional John Henry Irons. And since I can't find any other instances where he was called this, I guess it was just something they did for the story where this reality was simply just off kilter. The only other thing that I can think of is that the writers were trying to pay homage to Hank Aaron, the guy who held the record for the most home runs until Barry Bonds took steroids and then beat his record. But anyway, Superman, Steel, and Lois Lane, they make it to the JLA Watchtower on the moon and Superman battles a character named Ignition, one of the JLA members who threatens to hurt Lois. This triggers Superman's memory that he cares about Lois Lane and reaffirms his suspicion that there are huge chunks of his memory missing. Now, after he defeats Ignition, he's once again confronted by Mr. M, who restores all of Superman's memories. Now, for those of you guys who don't know who Mr. M is, he's an imp from the fifth dimension, which basically grants him like these crazy, vast reality warping powers. Now, throughout Superman's long history, he has encountered Mr. M a multitude of times, and Mr. M has made it a tradition of his to visit Superman's Earth every 90 days because he just enjoys messing around with him. There's a really good chance that if you've ever heard of Mr. Mixopidelic, it was because of Superman the Animated Series. But in almost all of these instances, Mr. M uses his reality warping ability to play cartoonish pranks on Superman to torment him. And then in order to send Mr. M back to his own dimension, Superman has to trick him into saying his own name backwards, which is basically what he does here. But when Mr. M complies, 
nothing happens. And so he explains to Superman that he's no longer in charge of this reality. At this point, we learn exactly who it is that's pulling the strings in this mixed up universe as Mr. M reveals that he thought it would be fun if he gave the Joker 1% of his power because he was bored and wanted to see what hijinks the Joker would be able to pull if he were to possess just a fraction of Mr. M's reality warping abilities. What happened though is that the Joker managed to trick Mr. M into revealing a secret name, thereby giving him 99.9% .9 of his power, which the Joker used to recreate the universe in his own image. Now, in terms of what Emperor Joker is capable of, Mr. M explains that he could destroy all of reality, which Mr. M had always been capable of doing, but never had because he wouldn't have anybody to mess around with. Joker, on the other hand, is a homicidal maniac and would have no qualms about wiping everyone from existence. And so we also learn that the more comfortable Joker becomes with his abilities, the stronger he'll become. And so eventually he'll be able to control all time and space. Now, what we end up finding out is that the Joker for the most part has done just that, altered the very fabric of reality and crowned himself king of the universe and set up a royal court consisting of the JLA, the Riddler, who he's renamed Enigma, Harley Quinn, who he calls his babe in waiting because that's pretty much where she's always been, and Lex Luthor, who he's forced to serve as the court jester. Now, as you might expect from a psychopath who's become virtually God, Joker does some pretty evil and crazy things, like wiping out all of the People's Republic of China, which totals to around a billion people, and then eating their skulls out of a Chinese takeout container with chopsticks. Let's say that again, all right? He ate their skulls out of a Chinese takeout container with chopsticks. That's pretty messed up. Now, the Jokers also use his powers to remake the members of the real Justice League into ridiculous caricatures of themselves. Of course, we already talked about Aquaman, who's basically a man-fish hybrid, but Wonder Woman is a hapless housewife. The Flash is still super fast, but has an insatiable appetite for junk food. Martian Manhunter has been shrunken to three feet tall and desires only to destroy the Earth, just like Marvin the Martian. Plastic Man is a credit card thief, and Kyle Rayner has become the yellow paper lantern. Now, we also learn that Joker has killed Dick Grayson and Tim Drake, and has taken Batman prisoner and tortures him, and then kills him on a daily basis, only to bring him back to life so he can do it all over again the next day. Now, these are just the few things that the Joker's done, and so we know that Emperor Joker is definitively beyond Omega level. He can bend reality to his whims, he can kill people and resurrect them, and then change anything he wants in all of time and space, meaning that there's literally nothing nothing that he doesn't have the power to do if he so wished. And so to get a sense of where Emperor Joker ranks in the pantheon of DC characters, we need only look at the scene where Darkseid, one of the most powerful villains in the history of DC, tries to appeal to some of the other most powerful characters in the DC universe, including Ganthet, one of the guardians of the universe, the wizard Shazam, Zeus, one of the gods of the Greek pantheon, the High Father, and Phantom Stranger, basically telling them that the Joker is in possession of the anti-life equation, which would basically allow him to control the minds of all sentient beings. Now, Darkseid quickly finds out that he's arrived too late and that all these super powerful beings have already had their consciousness replaced by the Joker. And so Darkseid is subsequently subdued by the Joker as well. And so yeah, Emperor Joker is crazy powerful with all the stuff that he can do in addition to just kind of being insane. And so what happens from here is that Superman rescues Batman, but Lois Lane makes a deal with Joker to become his new babe in waiting and then betrays Superman. And so Joker imprisons Batman once again and forces Superman to live out a television show for Joker's amusement where everyone close to the Man of Steel, including Supergirl, Steel, and Superboy, are destroyed whenever he gets too close to them. Now, Superman is soon transported to a remote location in space by the Spectre, who's basically the vengeful arm of God, and informs him that Joker's going to destroy the entire universe and that only Superman can stop him because Spectre is on the verge of being trapped by the Joker as well. Now, to give you some perspective of just how powerful the Spectre is, and by extension, how powerful Emperor Joker is, in DC Comics Presents number 29, Superman punched the Spectre and absolutely nothing happened. Not a single thing. And so Superman is then returned to the Joker's TV show, but he tells the Joker that he knows the world that he's created is not real and that he'll never stop fighting to bring the world back. Now, this display of bravery inspires the rest of the Justice League members to remember their past selves and then revert back into their traditional forms. I know it's lazy. It's kind of lazy writing. You know, it's not the best 
plot ever, but it works. But after this, Lois Lane switches sides again. My God, man, this girl switches sides more than a high school girl. But after this, Lois Lane switches sides again and then takes up Superman's side because she realizes that he's right about the universe that Joker created being a lie. And so she frees Superman from his restraints and tells him to defeat the Joker. Now, when Joker finds out about her betrayal, he tries to kill her and grows himself into gigantic proportions. But Superman literally flies up through the Joker's body and out of his forehead. Of course, this particular action of Superman doesn't actually kill the Joker since he's nearly indestructible. He's basically God. Now, following this, Superman is once again visited by Mr. M, who tells him that the only way to defeat Emperor Joker is to figure out the rules that Joker's playing by. Now, of course, Superman eventually figures out that the Joker has not yet erased Batman from existence because without Batman, the Joker's existence itself is meaningless. And so when he's confronted with this realization, the Joker just simply lashes out and tries to kill Batman, but realizes that he can't do it. Now, after repeated attempts, Joker realizes that Superman's correct, and this realization actually causes the Joker to lose his powers, and he reverts back to his normal form. Now, after the Joker's ousted, Superman, Mr. M, and the Spectre reform the universe the way it should be, but Batman's left broken due to the memories of the repeated torture, death, and resurrection that he had to endure. And so feeling that Bruce deserves to be free of this pain, and fearing that he would not survive in this broken state, Superman absorbs those memories so that Batman can function normally, and the Joker's imprisoned in the slab metahuman prison in New York. And so that pretty much wraps the story up. I mean, that's really just kind of how it ends. But I wanted to imagine for a minute what Emperor Joker would have truly been capable of. This story was written in the year 2000, when Superman comics were fairly lighthearted. So while the Joker does do some crazy stuff and even torture and kill Batman, most of the things Joker did emphasized the more cartoonish and goofy aspects of his character instead of those truly dark and evil sadistic parts. And so I just want to point out what we had seen if Emperor Joker had been written by a writer that really played into the darker, more demented aspects of the Joker, and that we would see him do some pretty heinous stuff and remember him as one of the most powerful evil forces in DC Comics. But at any rate, for the brief moment that we had Emperor Joker in comics, he was without a doubt one of the most powerful characters that we've ever seen in the history of DC's publications. Anybody that could bend the minds of some of DC's most powerful characters, basically their virtual gods, including the Spectre, High Father, Zeus, bend all their minds to their will and then control and destroy all of time and space is clearly a character that's beyond Omega level, or at least he would be if such a thing existed in DC Comics. But with that being said, guys, we're going to go ahead and bring this video to an end. Let me know how you guys feel about expanding this whole, you know, Omega level thing into DC. I think it's cool. I think it's a pretty cool idea. It allows us to tap into the power levels of characters that we wouldn't normally tap into. But let me know what you guys think down in the uh, comment section. Leave a comment below. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I'll catch you guys later. Peace.